Olá, bem-vindos à quinta aula. Nesta aula, você irá aprender um pouco sobre as fases de preparação para levar um sujeito à hipnose, ou seja, o rapor. Ele dá uma esmiuçadinha bem leve nesse vídeo aula, mas para que você comece a entender então como é preparar o sujeito para um transe hipnótico formal. Uma boa aula e continue assistindo e estudando acima de tudo. Hi there, welcome back to How to Hypnotize Without Trance Part 5. And if you're watching this, and you're watching this right now, my hope is that you've already had the opportunity to go through the three-part handstick tutorial. If you haven't, if you haven't been able to do that, please do make sure that you go back and do that, because within those videos, there's an awful lot of subtlety, an awful lot of nuance, an awful lot of bits and pieces, that when you absorb them, when you take them into yourself and take them on board, will help you to become a really effective hypnotist. Now, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning of that video, of that three-part tutorial, was that I was unable to get the setup filmed. That was something that was very, very difficult to film. But it's a very, very crucial part of the process. There's a tendency when people see hypnosis processes to think, well, you know, it's the actual process that counts. It's the words you say while you're setting up the loop. It's the words you say, the way you direct the person while you're actually taking them through the process. And that is absolutely crucial stuff. But the real place where success or failure is seeded is during the setup phase. How you draw somebody into the process, how you engineer buy-in, how you get them into doing it. And this is what I'm going to be talking about on this video. So let me hand you over to me and I will tell you all about how to set up a formal hypnosis session. What I want to do here is talk a bit about setting up hypnosis. If you watch the handstick video, you'll know that I mentioned on there that what I hadn't included, what I hadn't filmed, was the setup for the thing, how I set the situation up to then be able to go on and do that handstick routine. Now, the setup is absolutely crucial. It's an absolutely crucial part of the process because it's either going to set you up for success or it's going to set you up for failure. Um, what you're really doing with this setup is setting the frames, you're setting all the, the, the big becauses around it. You're setting up the dynamic so as you can, you can then go on to begin to set up the hypnotic loops proper. I've written something about this already and it's, uh, uh, the, what I've written down is an expansion of an, an answer I put or a, a post I put on a thread on an NLP connection so I've expanded it out. But I want to add one or two bits in this video. I want to add one or two extra angles, extra dimensions. First thing I'm going to say here is every time you do hypnosis, you're likely to be in a different kind of context. This is true for me anyway. I do hypnosis across so many different contexts. And for this reason, I think having a scripted pre-talk doesn't work. I think you need to be flexible about your approach. And for this reason, I keep certain principles in mind, certain things that I want to make happen. And uh, I've talked a bit about these in the article, but the main thing that I'm thinking about is, is getting buy-in. This is the big thing. The big thing is getting buy-in. In order to get buy-in, there are some other things that can really help that out, some other things that almost have to happen. One of them is that you get rapport and you depressurize the situation. This simply means getting people to be comfortable with you and comfortable with the situation they're in. So unless you have that, it's going to be difficult to get buy-in. So that's an important element. The other element is seeding. I'm going to talk about this first, seeding. Seeding is the idea of planting the possibility for hypnosis in somebody's mind and then backing off and letting it grow. And there's a strong advantage to this approach. When you seed an idea, you back off, you let it grow. It, it, it engages people's curiosity in a very natural way, a very kind of naturalistic way. And you're setting up the conditions whereby they become curious about hypnosis and what that might be like. So they start to wonder what 
it would be like for you to hypnotise them. And this is the seed that grows into them wanting to be hypnotised by you. This is a really, really big thing. You will get much better results from people if they want to be hypnotised by you rather than you wanting to hypnotise them. So anything that you can do to flip that dynamic round and have it so they want that from you is powerful. And seeding is uh, a really powerful way of doing this. I'll give you a couple of examples in different contexts. I do a lot of work for a local college, Further Education College. They have me in to do talks, motivational talks for, for 17, 18 year old behaviourally challenged kids. At the beginning I will often mention I'm a hypnotherapist and then I don't really say anything more about that. Usually when I ask if there are any questions at the end, the thing that they want to ask about is the hypnosis and I will get asked, you know, are you going to do any hypnosis? Are you going to hypnotise us? So I've set that up in that context, and I will often do it, um, uh, and it can be a very powerful thing. They will remember that. They will remember that uh, that talk that I've given. If some hypnosis has taken place at the end. So there's one example. Another example in a different context is often when I go out performing, I'll go up to people and say, "Hey guys, how's it going? My name is James. I'm entertaining people here this evening with magic, mind reading, and hypnosis. So, do you want to see something?" And then I'll go on and I'll do some magic. But that whole hypnosis idea is brewing in the back of their mind. It's, it's turning over in the back of their mind. Just a quick tip on the, on the side. When you say the word hypnosis, when you first see it, watch for people's reactions. Look for people's reactions. You'll get different kinds of reactions. Some people will almost recoil away and some people will lean in, fascinated. And some people will just won't seem to respond at all. The ones who lean and fascinate and the ones who recoil away, you can flag them up because there's a good chance they're going to be good subjects for you later on. So there's another side to doing the seeding there. Again, just that last thing, seeding's about making people want that. Remember, it's about making them want it from you. Rapport and depressurization. I can't go into rapport in great detail here because there's too much to say about that. There's too much to say about rapport. What I will say is I often take the pressure off the situation by framing what I'm doing as not hypnosis, even though um, I've talked about hypnosis already and we may be discussing hypnosis. So I'll go ahead and say, well, look, let's, let's do a little something. It's not really hypnosis, but it will give you a sense of how hypnosis works. And that line works to take the pressure off because we're not actually doing hypnosis now. We're just doing a little something to get a sense for how hypnosis works. There's all kinds of clever bits in there because it does presuppose that hypnosis works. It also presupposes that what we're going to do is going to work and it's going to show them something. So it, it kind of engages the mind. So there's this whole thing about rapport and uh, depressurization. If people don't feel comfortable with you, if they don't feel comfortable with the interaction they're in, hypnosis is not going to take place. So take a little bit of time. I've said this in the write-up. Hypnosis is much more like... Um, seduction than, it's, than, than persuasion. It's like you're drawing people in uh, at a pace that's right for them. You're not forcing them, you're not pushing them, you're not pressuring them. Sometimes you can use a high pressure um, methodology and that can work, but that's not what I'm talking about right here. Last thing, most important thing is buy-in. If I'm going to do hypnosis with somebody, and I'm going to do overt hypnosis with somebody, I want to get a clear buy-in for them doing the process for them being in the process. So I'll often ask them outright, are you happy to do this now? Do you want to do this now? And I want to get a yes, and I'm looking for congruence in that yes. So I'm looking for certainty in that yes, not, yeah, you know, maybe. Um, or, yeah, yeah, we could do, yeah. Or, yeah, okay, nothing like that, I wouldn't, yes. And I will also often ask other questions as well. I ask the concentration and the imagination questions. Um, I'll say, okay, before we do this, do you have a good imagination? They may or may not say yes to that, but if they say yes emphatically, I know they're keen to do it. If they say, well, I don't know, I'll say, would you like to have a good imagination? Uh, and I'm looking for a yes, another congruent, absolute, certain yes at that point. So I'm using the imagination question not only to set up the idea that they're going to be using their imagination, but to get congruent yeses for this buy-in, to flag this buy-in. The other element to that is, I'll then go on to ask the concentration question. Can you concentrate? Well, how about concentration? Are you good at concentrating? And again, I'm looking for a yes, or a sometimes, or something like that. And I'm going to say, can you concentrate now? If they say, well, I'll give it a go, and I, I, I'll say, okay, um, 
in order for this to work, you really do need to be able to concentrate. So being aware of the context you're in, are you able to do that 100%, give that 100% of your concentration? And I want to get a yes again at that point. So I'm looking for buy and I'm eliciting these yes responses. It goes beyond a yes set because it's not enough that they say yes. It's enough that they're, they're screaming yes with every molecule of their being. That they're just absolutely certain yes. And that's what I want. When you get that yes verbalised as well, people will tend to go along with you in the process. It's one of Cardini's laws. If you've read... Um, if you've read Robert Cardini's book, The Psychology of Influence, it's one of Cardini's laws, that of consistency, that, that people want to be consistent with what they've already stated, what they've agreed with. So once you've had somebody verbalise that buy-in, they will tend to be consistent and go along with you in the process. Okay, there's just one or two um, little extra bits and pieces in there that I hope are going to be useful to you. I'm not going to say any more because I want to keep this video short. Remember those things, play around with them, find your way, find your own way of seeding things, find your own way of building rapport and depressurizing the situation and find your own way of getting buy-in and feeling it within yourself, knowing that you've got that absolute congruent brain. If you can get all that stuff in there, however you do your setup, it's going to be so much more effective, trust me on that one. So go out, play around with that and uh, please do give me any feedback, let me know how it works out for you.